agenda is going to be uh, on Docker. Uh, it is just basics, and uh, I'll be explaining about Docker architecture and networking basics. And when it comes to Kubernetes, so I'll be uh, explaining uh, uh, basics. Uh, I see, Nivasa. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Can we record the? All right, guys. So. And the next topic for uh, today is Kubernetes. And as part of uh, Kubernetes, uh, we'll be uh, uh, covering basics and the architecture and the concepts primarily. Okay. Let us uh, 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 go to Docker's, right? So, <clears throat> so the Docker history begins in the year 2013. Right, so it releases as an open source initially, and then Red Hat has been, you know, contributed, and then uh, uh, GitHub as well, right? So in the year 2015, Microsoft has, you know, started contributing, uh, and you know, from 2000 uh, uh, Server 16 uh, uh, edition onwards, you know, they are uh, uh, um, releasing uh, the operating system with the uh, container. Um, built in, right? And uh, if you see the history, the evolution, right? So the evolution of uh, IT, right? So <clears throat> so the evolution begins. So uh, earlier we do have, you know, kind of a waterfall. Uh, uh, <coughs> methodology to deliver uh, uh, any uh, IT solution, right? So after that, uh, uh, agile process, right? So after that, right? So DevOps. So DevOps is uh, the current uh, um, hot technology where you know uh, all the um, um, operations and uh, development process has been combined and then merged into single framework and then has been you know started delivering. Right, so unlike earlier process like uh, waterfall or agile, and when it comes to application architecture, so earlier, right, so it is like all monolithic. So when I say monolithic uh, architecture, so it is like you know kind of two tier architecture, three tier architecture, like you know kind of n tier architecture. So now the monolithic has been evolved. Uh, as a microservices architecture, right? So in this microservices architecture, so each small component of uh, application uh, will be acting as one service, right? So in earlier monolithic architecture, entire code will be, has to be, you know, uh, act as a single application. And during that, so if there is any single failure, right? So entire uh, uh, whole application uh, uh, used to be impacted. And you know, used to be um, production outage, right? And when it comes to microservices architecture, so it is like you know they have uh, subdivided the entire monolithic uh, single code into uh, subdivisions. Suppose you take one banking application, right? So banking, you have SMS application, you have uh, see the uh, bank balance and uh, uh, raise a request for check checkbook, right? So these are the three typical use cases. Right, so in microservices architecture, suppose if there is a failure of uh, uh, the application, which is uh, the SMS application, right? So if there is a failure at SMS application, you still have the remaining two uh, services like uh, checking bank balance and requesting a checkbook, right? So those two services will still continue servicing. So this is a microservices uh, benefits. And when it comes to hosting, like uh, the physical uh, compute, storage, memory. So earlier, right, so we have uh, begun with physical server, right? So we used to um, deploy whole code, whole application, right? Whole software into physical server in earlier days, right? So after that, so virtualization has uh, come into picture. So when I say virtualization, it is like, you know, VMware uh, solution or Microsoft Hyper-V solution or Citrix uh, Zen solutions. So these are the uh, virtualization technologies. So now the latest trend is containers. So that is what we are going to discuss uh, 
uh, about in today's uh, two hour session. So containers is the hot technology uh, in the market as of today. And when it comes to hosting, right? So data center hosting, so we used to rack stack the servers uh, in a uh, on-premise uh, um, location or at the data center locations where, you know, where uh, data center providers, uh, they can provide this space, rack, rack stack, all those things, right? So after that, so the latest trend is cloud, right? So nobody knows where uh, uh, the virtual machines are hosted on uh, uh, which data center location within Azure or AWS, right? So, so the latest uh, trend is cloud. <clears throat> All right, so, <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, the history for the containers uh, technology, right? So the history, if you see the history began in the year 1980, uh, Unix v7, right? And then FreeBSD uh, in the year 2000, then Linux has uh, uh, started working on uh, container technology on, uh, in the year 2001, and then Oracle has started, and then uh, uh, AX, LCX, right, and Warden, and Docker. Docker, if you see the Docker history, so it is uh, uh, started in the year 2013, right? After that, RKT has uh, come in the 2014, and then OCI, okay? Okay. <coughs> So why Docker is very hot uh, in the current uh, um, IT era? Uh, why? Because <clears throat> so we can run all uh, development and uh, test uh, environments on Docker's, and we can use uh, these Docker technologies for you know uh, developing uh, new applications. And uh, so there is a lot of agility, and it is a DevOps friendly, right? And uh, it is, uh, it, in fact, it came from uh, you know, open source, right? And uh, it is a microservices and cloud native uh, built-in uh, um, technology, right? So let me... Uh, all right, guys, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. So why containers again? So why because, <clears throat> so developers need their code to be, you know, um, ASAP built and then uh, move to uh, staging and then production. So this is a typical developer requirement, right? And at the same time, so, uh, so there should be like, you know, some kind of automation, integration and packaging so that uh, the code can be uh, upgraded uh, um, as and when needed, right? And uh, it should uh, support the next gen applications like microservices, right? All right, so let us talk about what is Docker all about. So Docker basically it is uh, a open platform for developers and sysadmins, right? For building and uh, shipping and then uh, uh, deploying uh, the applications into uh, staging and then production, right? So basically it is like, you know, build, ship, run any app anywhere, you know, kind of, uh, so if you have .NET application, right? So then just build it on, uh, um, on uh, <clears throat> containers and then uh, uh, test it and then uh, uh, move to uh, staging or production, right? So so basically it is like, you know, kind of, uh, um, uh, it can uh, available on Linux distributions as well as Windows and uh, uh, Mac operating systems as well, right? So it supports, uh, as I said, so it supports development test and continuous integration and continuous developments and you know develop uh, 
um, platforms, all right? So containers uh, uh, comes with the various uh, Linux distributions like uh, uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat, CentOS, and OpenSUSE. And also, so various cloud uh, providers like Amazon, uh, Google Cloud, and IBM Cloud, and Microsoft Azure. So all these uh, cloud providers are you know, providing uh, uh, containers as a service, right? So CAS, CAS. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so, what is the difference between uh, the previous uh, virtualization technology and uh, the current uh, Docker uh, uh, containers uh, virtualization technology? Right. So, previously, so when we say virtualization, so 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 it refers uh, to uh, uh, operating system. It refers uh, primarily uh, to uh, physical infrastructure on top of on top of uh, your hypervisor and on top of your hypervisor there are uh, multiple virtual machines right so each virtual virtual machine will have a, a dedicated operating system on top of the dedicated oper operating system so um, so the developer has to host uh, his application his code his binaries his library right suppose if there are uh, Ten applications, right? So, so then, um, so there is no other way uh, other than you know he has to build ten uh, virtual machine servers and then uh, deploy separately on ten machines. And uh, so you just imagine if uh, there is a maintenance activity, right? So, so that means so they have to perform individually on ten uh, virtual machines, right? And when it comes to container, right? So container again, so. See the infrastructure is common across VM and uh, uh, container. Only the difference is uh, um, so there is no hypervisor uh, uh, in the container, right? So in place of hypervisor, so there is a Docker engine, right? So Docker engine. So what it does is uh, it uh, it it slices your operating system into you know thin layers, and each layer will be acting as uh, uh, separate uh, container like you know if you have 10 uh, applications right so as I said earlier you, in the previous example you need 10 VMs in this case if you have 10 virtual machines right you, sorry if you have 10 uh, applications all those 10 applications right so you can uh, um, deploy in single container which is uh, having uh, um, 10 uh, um, parts within a container right so this is the difference, uh, a primary difference. All right, and containers include uh, the application and uh, all of its dependencies, right? But it share the kernel with uh, uh, other containers, right? It runs as an isolated process in uh, user space on, on the host. Okay. So, so this is a Docker technology. So when I said Docker, so primarily it is like you know platform virtualization, right? So earlier uh, virtualization technology like VMware, they are server virtualization, right? So your physical server hardware uh, will be sliced uh, uh, and provided to the uh, VMs. So in this case, it is a platform. So within OS, uh, again, uh, uh, the further uh, segregation right so um, <coughs> so it is a layered file system all right okay so so when i said docker right so so these are the typical terminology so docker images right so it is like you know so kind of uh, a repository through docker hub Right, so Vagrant, so Docker for virtual machines, and automation, right? So kind of a, a puppet chef for Ansible. So these are the tools to automate uh, uh, the functions uh, uh, within, uh, you know, uh, between uh, containers or between containers and your physical infrastructure, right? <clears throat> Mm. 
Right, so Docker Hub. So Docker Hub, it is a public repository of uh, Docker images, right? So all uh, the images can be stored uh, at Docker Hub and the images can be, you know, um, downloaded, like, you know, kind of pull and whenever uh, uh, there is a need, right? So the same repository can be used uh, as a repository. So we can upload uh, uh, the um, updates to the Docker Hub. for various purposes, right? So, <clears throat> and so basically Docker, it is a kind of, you know, shipping container system for code. Suppose you have code, right? So you have code and you have various dependencies and you have a, uh, multiple configuration files, right? So what happens uh, with uh, Docker is, so you just um, <clears throat> keep everything, your code, your dependencies, your uh, uh, database, your networking, your storage, right? So all those things, keep it as a bundle and then keep it in uh, Docker. And then, you know, um, deploy the Docker uh, uh, container. So anywhere, uh, uh, um, and uh, 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 any time kind of, uh, you know, access, right? <clears throat> right, so, <clears throat> so when it comes to, you know, Docker, so why we need uh, Docker and what it is. So why we need Docker is like, you know, so we can run uh, uh, the Docker containers uh, everywhere. So it, you know, regardless of your, uh, operating system or kernel version, right? And regardless of your uh, distribution, it can be Linux or Windows or anything. And it can be, uh, you can host your uh, um, Docker on physical or virtual, no matter, no difference, right? Or even in cloud. And container and host architecture should, you know, match. So that is only the uh, requirement, right? and run anything. So if it can run on the host, it can run in the container. Suppose, uh, so you have an application, Java application, which is uh, uh, deployed in uh, uh, Linux uh, platform, right? So the same thing, uh, it should be uh, uh, able to run on uh, Docker as well. So there should not be an issue, right? <clears throat> so if it can run on Linux kernel, so that means it can run on container as well, right? So what is Docker? So at high level, it is a lightweight uh, virtual machine. So it has its own processor space. It has its own network interface and can run stuff as root and uh, you know can have its own uh, uh, SBIN in it, right? And uh, when it comes to low level, so it is a kind of, you know, CH root on steroids can also not have its own SBI uh, in it, right? So containers, like, you know, they are like isolated processes and can share kernel with host, right? So so there is no device emulation, neither uh, hypervisors nor PV. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so why, first of all, why these Docker containers are, you know, lightweight? So as we discussed earlier, why? Because if you see the VM, virtual machine, right? So there is a guest OS, on top of guest OS, you have uh, um, binaries, libraries uh, uh, with the application, right? So you see here containers, right? So you have original application, right? And uh, so only copy of application, and modified app, so like, like you know, so you don't need to, you don't uh, have uh, the complete OS uh, button here at container because uh, uh, only the part of uh, the slice of your operating system will be utilized uh, by the container, right? So within that slice, your application will be hosted and your dependencies will be created, right? So this is the reason why Docker containers are, are very thin. All right. 
and when it comes to architecture so docker architecture <coughs> so this is a typical uh, docker architecture all right so so there is a docker client and uh, docker host is there so this is where uh, the daemon the actual daemon uh, uh, runs and there is a registry right so as i said registry so it keeps all the you know um, configuration uh, information and uh, uh, then you know kind of uh, image files all those right so you see the client so docker client it is like you know kind of um, uh, cli for interfacing with your docker uh, the actual host right and uh, so there is a docker uh, file so it is a kind of a text file of docker uh, which contains uh, the instructions right so what to do what to do and what not to do these kind of uh, instructions will be uh, contained in the docker file like you know kind of configuration data suppose my uh, my container should uh, have this much of memory this these many of uh, uh, cpus and uh, these these are my you know networks right so this kind of uh, information and uh, when it comes to images right so these are like hierarchies of uh, files built from docker file right so the file used as input to the docker uh, uh, build command okay and when it comes to container the actual core piece so this is uh, a running instance of an image using the docker right and when it comes to registry right so this is the image uh, uh, repository kind of uh, um, uh, location so where uh, so we can keep the uh, um, uh, copies of uh, various applications various files like suppose you have application version 1 version 2 version 3 right so um, <clears throat> So your uh, uh, business, they don't want any outage, but uh, they still need, but uh, developer, they still need to upgrade uh, uh, their environment due to, you know, some critical uh, um, patch, right? So in that case, so what happens is, so, so, so they need to update, uh, uh, suppose there are three uh, uh, versions available. So version three is uh, uh, in production, right? So that means, uh, version one and version two are like, you know, kind of, you know, uh, passive copies. So you can update uh, your uh, code on your passive copies, either on um, version one copy or version two, right? So once the upgrade is successful, then uh, it is just, you know, kind of switching. So you just uh, switch your version two as primary and then version three will become passive. So there is no downtime at all, right? So this is how, and at the same time, so um, uh, if you need to um, build any new application, right? So you can uh, keep uh, your master code uh, at uh, your registry location and then uh, download those uh, code and then build using that. So, uh, so these are the kind of typical use cases for uh, a registry, right? <clears throat> So this is a typical uh, uh, Docker container life cycle. So the life cycle begins with uh, building uh, an image from Docker file and then uh, 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 run it as a container, right? So, and then uh, uh, move it to, you know, kind of um, um, production, right? And then uh, uh, if uh, um, there is a uh, kind of, um, um, uh, so you need to decommission the same uh, uh, Docker container for various purposes, right? So then just kill that uh, uh, container, right? And uh, and then if uh, you need to again uh, um, bring a new container uh, for production, right? So just uh, build it and then start it, right? And then uh, RM is like, you know, kind of for Docker RM kind of, you know, delete, right? So this is a typical uh, uh, container life cycle, right? So this is a graphical uh, image, right? So how uh, uh, the Docker works, right? So, um, so build uh, through uh, source code repository here, 
and uh, so and then uh, move it to the container right so uh, within container you have docker engine right and then uh, you have this slice of uh, operating system right and then uh, push or pull uh, 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 the um, code from uh, the registry right so this is uh, the typical uh, how the docker works okay <clears throat> So these are the Docker features uh, primarily, and because of these uh, features only, the Docker is uh, um, very hot in the market. And this is a reason, one of the primary reason why uh, the companies uh, are started uh, using a, a container technology, right? So these are lightweight. So lightweight, you achieve through uh, uh, minimal overhead. Right uh, from CPU I/O network, right, and uh, these are like you know based on Linux uh, containers, so uh, better security and uh, decreased uh, storage consumption, and uh, it uses layered uh, file system, right. So um, hence uh, it could save the space, and it is very portable, so it can run everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it is Linux or Windows and it is a kind of you know self sufficient right so when i say self sufficient so the docker container so right so it can contain in a, it can contain everything it needs to run so within it so it doesn't require any kind of dependency right and uh, minimal base os and uh, so libraries and frameworks can uh, hold uh, within a uh, um, docker and your application code so these are the typical uh, very important feature features why the companies are you know uh, considering uh, the uh, container technology to uh, their application purposes okay so let us uh, uh, um, get into uh, a little bit deeper on uh, uh, docker architecture components right so as part of uh, docker architecture so we do have a docker image right so docker image so it is uh, an image uh, you know, it is a collection of files and also it contains some metadata right <clears throat> and uh, so each image can have you know its own software its own code its own dependencies right so whatever you want to run right so every image contains a base layer right so so the layers are like you know kind of read only layers like you know only kernel can read all those layers all right so when it comes to docker engine right so docker engine uh, can contain uh, 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 it is a kind of uh, a container execution and administration functionality it uses uh, linux kernel uh, namespaces and control groups right so docker engine typically uh, built on linux container uh, linux uh, uh, kernel so it uses uh, you know linux uh, uh, namespace and control groups right so namespaces provide for isolated workspaces <clears throat> see here uh, so the picture indicates there is a physical server right so on top of physical server uh, you have a, a linux os right so within linux os you have linux kernel and your docker engine is uh, uh, communicating with only Linux kernel, so it doesn't want to talk to directly uh, to your uh, uh, operating Linux OS or your physical resources like CPU memory. So it always uh, just communicates with your Linux kernel. All right. <clears throat> so when it comes to Docker file right so docker file so it is like uh, you know kind of a, a shell script with the keywords okay 
so so it can extend from base image right so it results in a new docker image suppose you have a docker file right so using docker file so you can create a uh, uh, n number of uh, docker images right so so it is like imperative so a docker file uh, lists the steps needed to build an image like you know kind of configuration file so step by step uh, uh, con configuration that will be there suppose i need this many cpus for my container i need uh, uh, this much of storage and i need uh, this much of uh, memory for my you know um, container so all those parameters can be uh, defined uh, in the docker file right and uh, <clears throat> so so <clears throat> so these are the uh, um, very common uh, uh, terms and commands so see here so when it comes to docker engine so you have a docker daemon docker registry and uh, uh, docker cli is there to execute uh, uh, various uh, administrative functions and you have docker image right so uh, it is like os uh, kernel okay supplies uh, for a specific instance type and a specific application so container so it is a um, pack of uh, application and a docker file so it is a you know kind of text file with a list of steps to perform to create a, a specific uh, image or you know application so docker hub is like you know kind of your uh, docker registry and repository used for uh, um, uh, various pull and push uh, activities. All right. <clears throat> so these are the typical uh, uh, Docker uh, uh, CLI commands. So um, so Docker build. This is a command. So where uh, you know so we'll be uh, uh, building uh, the images from Docker file. And uh, Docker run is you know kind of uh, um, command to run the image, and uh, Docker logs is like you know kind of uh, uh, it displays the log log data, and uh, Docker ps it lists uh, the running containers, right? And uh, Docker ps hyphen yeah it lists all containers including not running also right so, and Docker images. Uh, it lists all images on local volume <clears throat> and docker rm is uh, uh, you know kind of uh, it it can remove or delete a container from your machine right so so docker tag is you know kind of uh, we can name the docker image and uh, docker login is like uh, so it is a um, uh, login to the uh, uh, docker hub okay so docker push pull is a kind of uh, um, pull the image from docker hub from internet and uh, push the image to the docker hub over internet right <clears throat> so let us uh, 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 talk about uh, use cases <clears throat> so what are the use cases uh, primarily these uh, container technology uh, uh, people are uh, preferred okay <clears throat> right so <clears throat> so these are the typical use cases uh, suppose uh, so um, ready to run application stacks like you know kind of um, uh, development and uh, test uh, setups so container technology is uh, uh, the best uh, suitable use case. And uh, so where uh, you need to deploy the code, you need to move the code into production within hours, right? So container technology is a solution, right? And also you need to implement a new uh, uh, technologies like, you know, microservices, then Docker is the solution for you. And uh, um you you need to uh, have some kind of uh, you know middleware uh, front end applications where you know you need to uh, quickly use uh, and then test various applications then this is uh, doc container technology is uh, uh, the best solution 
right <clears throat> so these are the uh, 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 some of the use cases <clears throat> right so if you see the uh, market survey so so these are the typical uh, pictures like uh, development all development uh, 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 infrastructures are almost 65 percent are moved to container technology and continuous integration technologies are you know around 50 percent so devops is upcoming so around 40 uh, percent so far as of uh, uh, 2016 this report survey right so now the um, uh, it would have gone up to you know more than 70 percent devops right <clears throat> and uh, migrate to the cloud uh, uh, cloud right so almost 40 percent so th these are the survey results <clears throat> right let us uh, talk a little bit about docker uh, uh, or networking <clears throat> so first of all why we need uh, 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 container networking right so why because containers also they need to talk to external world even though your container is sitting uh, within uh, uh, os right so still they need to talk to external world so uh, suppose there is an application right so she is hosted uh, deployed in container right so and the, that application has to be accessed uh, uh, globally over internet so then you know obviously it require uh, external world connectivity right and also to reach containers from external world to use so the services that container provides as i said earlier so it allows containers to talk to host machine right and uh, inter-container connectivity uh, within same host and across hosts and uh, uh, discover uh, uh, services uh, provided by containers automatically and also it provides uh, uh, for load balancing purposes right and for uh, secure uh, multi-tenant um, services so so these are the typical use cases for uh, why we need containers uh, networking for containers okay <clears throat> so primarily so if you see this diagram so docker networking is uh, required for encryption to control and data plane and for load balancing for service discovery and for uh, uh, automation and for network drivers like you know bridging hosting overlay all those things all right <clears throat> so these are the typical uh, uh, um, uh, comparison between uh, docker and kubernetes networking right so <clears throat> see at the abstraction layer <clears throat> so docker so which uh, uh, talks on container right so on uh, kubernetes which uh, which is like you know pod and when it comes to uh, uh, networking protocols right so in docker cnm is the protocol and in kubernetes cni right and when it comes to service discovery right so the dns is embedded on docker and when it comes to kubernetes it is kube dns so a separate service and when it comes to internal load balancer right so it uh, docker uh, uh, depends upon IP tables and IPVS, right? And Kubernetes depends upon IP tables and Kube proxy, right? And when it comes to external load balancing, right? So Docker um, achieves uh, this through routing mesh, right? And whereas Kubernetes through node port. And uh, when it comes to external plugins, so Weave, Calico, Tantive, and uh, These are the typical uh, comparison between uh, uh, Docker and Kubernetes networking, right? <clears throat> so when it comes to IP address management, right? So, <clears throat> so 
so docker uh, it has its uh, own ip address management right and uh, so <clears throat> and also users can specify their own subnet so uh, if there is a requirement right and uh, docker also supports uh, you know I, um, ipv6 uh, uh, ip address as, as well for its containers okay docker so we'll be uh, uh, checking all those uh, uh, docker commands uh, as part of this lab so let me go to my uh, uh, docker this uh, talks about little bit uh, deeper uh, uh, the uh, network uh, driver uh, between docker and uh, uh, kubernetes right so this is a kind of uh, uh, so if you see here uh, when it comes to connectivity right so <clears throat> right so so bridge uh, network it uh, it happens between same host right and the host network is you know kind of uh, again same host and overlay network uh, is you know kind of multi host connectivity okay and uh, when it comes to uh, uh, external connectivity right so your bridge network uh, it uh, happens through natting and even user defined bridge also through nat and when it comes to host network right so this is uh, through a uh, host gateway right and when it comes to uh, uh, namespace dns right so through bridge network it is a kind of you know it, it has to go separately okay and when it comes to uh, uh, application uh, traffic right so you see the bridge network it is always uh, north south traffic right so south is like your external traffic and even uh, uh, the host also it requires uh, full networking control and isolation not required okay and overlay is like you know kind of uh, uh, container connectivity across uh, hosts right so these are the typical uh, network driver types okay okay all right so let me uh, uh, get into uh, the docker uh, uh, machine so let us uh, yeah this is my docker machine right so i have built uh, my docker on top of uh, my uh, windows 2016 server right so we build uh, docker on windows right so primarily so we need to uh, so we need to enable uh, uh, the container uh, feature so where we enable uh, the feature is like right so <clears throat> come here add roles and features right next next see here this is the container feature so you just need to click click next next and then your container feature will be enabled and then reboot the uh, node your container feature is enabled so after that so you need to uh, download uh, the docker uh, uh, from docker uh, uh, hub and then execute then your container is ready right so so see this is my container <clears throat> so i just executed uh, uh, to list uh, uh, the list of containers hosted on this uh, machine right so docker ps so it doesn't display anything because uh, nothing is uh, um, hosted on this machine okay right so there are no other uh, containers as well on this machine okay so and then let me verify so if there are any uh, docker images right so 
right so there are no docker images which are downloaded uh, uh, from on this uh, machine okay so let me log in uh, to docker so that we can try to uh, uh, pull a couple of images So I am logging, uh, I'm trying to uh, log into my Docker login, so which is uh, dockerhub.com. Okay, so my login succeeded. So now let me uh, uh, try uh, to run, uh, to uh, download uh, the um, package so that we can install an application, right? <clears throat> so let me download uh, uh, the ASP.NET uh, application. Uh, application to host in my container okay <clears throat> so what it does if i locally and if it doesn't find then uh, uh, it uh, goes to uh, my docker hub login and from there uh, it uh, gets the uh, it pulls the image right once the image is pulled, so it uh, it will automatically deploy that ASP.NET, and then it is available uh, in uh, uh, my Docker container. Okay, so this will take uh, uh, some time, and let us uh, execute a couple of other uh, uh, Docker commands. Hello, can you guys hear me, please? Hello. Yes. Okay, cool, thanks. 
Okay, so yeah, so I just uh, executed uh, uh, the Docker version command, right? So it displayed. Uh, so this is my Docker. Uh, uh, this is a Docker engine community edition, and this is the version number, and this is my API version, and this is my Go version, right? So this is a Git commit, the version number kind of, right? So the architecture is Windows. Right, and uh, yeah, so these are the uh, Docker version. Okay, all right. So with this, uh, so yeah, so this, uh, so this is uh, a kind of uh, you know eight GB file. So it will obviously it will take some time. So let us uh, uh, keep this uh, running in the uh, background. Okay, <coughs> so. Let me also show you the uh, lab, how I prepared uh, the Docker uh, lab. Right, so to enable uh, your uh, uh, Docker, right, so you should uh, enable uh, uh, the um, nested virtualization on your uh, lo local machine, on your laptops or desktops, right? So this is how you should enable. Okay, and the minimum requirement for uh, uh, to enable Docker is at least uh, four GB memory. All right, and uh, thirty-two GB hard disk. Okay, and your Docker. Uh, uh, machine should have internet access, so then only it will, you can uh, uh, push or pull the images uh, from Docker Hub. Okay, all right, guys. So with this, so we are done with uh, 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 Docker. So let me move on to the next topic. So which is Kubernetes container, Docker container. Let me open this as part of Docker uh, uh, container, right? So when I enable Docker container, see here, <coughs> it created its own uh, uh, Mobi Linux virtual machine. So this is how your kernel is still Linux. All right. Uh, let me. Go through the other questions. Yeah, for this question answer is S. I've used uh, the sample image, which is ASP dot uh, net application we have pulled that image from docker uh, repository okay if you have the same image uh, uh, which is available locally on your machine right so we can uh, use the local copy of your uh, uh, ASV dot uh, net application okay yes that is possible okay so the next question is uh, how clustering like uh, Hazel cast works with Docker containerization? Yes, right. So this is a good question. So in Docker, uh, so <coughs> so primarily uh, uh, the clustering happens uh, uh, through you know kind of uh, so there is a Docker swarm uh, uh, technology where you know it provides your orchestration and clustering as well, right? You know kind of. Uh, Multi management tool. Okay. So the next question is any sample application? Yes, there are plenty of uh, sample applications which are available in Docker Hub. So you just need to create one uh, Docker login. Uh, so, how you uh, need to create Docker login is uh, let me uh, show you that.
All right, so this is my uh, uh, Docker login, right? So this is my user ID. So the same way you can create your own uh, 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 login. I am just logging out. So here uh, you will get option to create your uh, Docker account. Okay. So you just need to provide your uh, Docker ID, email, password. That's it. You are done. So your uh, uh, ID is created. All right. So So the IP addresses will be uh, managed uh, within Docker by Docker kernel, Docker engine, all right? However, you have the option to uh, change, modify those IPs uh, if required, okay? But that is not suggested. So is there any visual tool to check if there are quite large number of containers are running instead of checking through commands? uh like docker cli yes there are docker cli commands available so so in fact uh, so this is uh, the cli tool where uh, you know we are playing comma executing commands all right So, so far we have completed uh, on dockers, right? <clears throat> so when uh, the docker itself uh, uh, could provide us uh, uh, the uh, uh, container virtualization, then why do we need uh, uh, Kubernetes, right? So these are the questions uh, we should get. <clears throat> okay, so what is Kubernetes first of all? So Kubernetes, uh, uh, it is uh, a open source uh, uh, container cluster manager, right? So it is an open source container cluster manager, okay? So it provides uh, basically the orchestration, right? So when I say orchestration, so it can create, uh, 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 it can automate, so it can uh, uh, do various functionalities of uh, containers using a single dashboard, which is Kubernetes dashboard. <clears throat> All right, so, <clears throat> so when we talk about Kubernetes, right, so immediately there is a, a term which is pod. What is pod all about? It is the smallest uh, deployable uh, uh, unit of compute. Right, so it is a kind of you know your virtual machine uh, in a, <clears throat> in a traditional or legacy way of a, a virtual machine. Right, so it is a typical uh, um, uh, smallest uh, mini uh, deployable unit of your compute, like your uh, mini virtual machine. It uh, consists of one or more containers that are always co-located and can co-schedule and can run in a shared context. Right. <clears throat> so single pod can have multiple containers, all right? <clears throat> so why we need Kubernetes? Because uh, the Docker itself is uh, uh, providing various uh, uh, benefits, right? So why we need Kubernetes? So why? Because <clears throat> again, it can run anywhere. So Kubernetes uh, can uh, uh, can be hosted on on premises and when i say on premises that can be bare metal or that can be open stack or even you know virtual machines and it can be uh, on public clouds like uh, google azure or aws right so the main aim is uh, use kubernetes so it is a kind of you know abstraction layer <clears throat> right so when i say abstraction layer it can migrate uh, to container containerized uh, applications, right? So managed by Kubernetes and can use uh, uh, Kubernetes API. So when I say API, so it is a kind of, you know, integration uh, uh, 
uh, interface where you can uh, uh, manage, monitor, and maintain your uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, dashboard using API, right? <clears throat> and uh, Kubernetes uh, is like, uh, um, so there is no vendor lock-in here. So anybody uh, can use uh, Kubernetes and uh, it can uh, uh, deploy anywhere on Azure, AWS, or Google Cloud, or even uh, um, um, on-premises as well. All right. <clears throat> so these are the typical uh, core features of uh, Kubernetes. So it provides uh, automatic uh, uh, binary packing, right? So it provides uh, your uh, uh, load balancing and service discovery, right? And uh, storage uh, orchestration is possible and self-healing at the application level, okay? And the secrecy and the configuration management, right? So through uh, 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 configuration management tools like Ansible or Chef or Puppet, right? And uh, it can do batch execution, right? So multiple schedules can trigger. Uh, and uh, it can provide horizontal scaling. Suppose, uh, so one pod is uh, um, suffering with performance issue, right? Then immediately what it does, it will uh, uh, just scale out, right? It just scale out and then deploy uh, one more pod and then provide uh, the services, okay? And then automatic rollbacks and rollouts when there is a, uh, um, uh, when there is a demand. When I say there is a demand, suppose you take a, uh, one uh, use case like web server, right? So web server uh, uh, like uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon portal during offer uh, uh, season. So there will be heavy flood, heavy web requests to that portal, right? So during that scenario, your Kubernetes can uh, increase the number of instances, container instances, your uh, pods can be, you know, increased uh, horizontally, right? during off season, so to avoid uh, additional billing and additional computing, right? So it can uh, automatically delete the uh, unused or, you know, ineffective uh, uh, containers pods, right? So this is automatic rollbacks and rollouts. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, as I was telling, so why do we need a, a, a Kubernetes? Because we have already Docker, okay? So why? Because uh, the do Docker provides uh, uh, um, open standard for packaging and distributing your containerized applications, right? So, so this is the typical uh, uh, job of your Docker. But how would all these containers, right, be coordinate and then scheduled? So how these uh, uh, connectivity uh, between these uh, multiple containers happens? We will do all those, uh, you know, um, um, maintenance. We will be monitoring. We will be doing a governance, right? <clears throat> how do all these uh, different containers in your application communicate with each other, right? How these containers uh, or uh, uh, instances can be, you know, scaled? Right, so the answer is Kubernetes. Kubernetes does all this for uh, uh, for us. Okay. <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, uh, orchestration, uh, container orchestration systems, so we do have uh, so so these uh, many like uh, Docker Swarm is uh, available from Docker. And the Kubernetes is available from Google and uh, Mesh OS. So these are the typical uh, uh, popular uh, uh, container orchestrators. So out of these three, Kubernetes is the popular one, and Docker Swarm is you know uh, kind of uh, the second uh, uh, place has. Okay. So now let us talk about uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, architecture. Okay. <clears throat> so, 
so this is the typical uh, architecture <coughs> so these are the main uh, components so there is a master node and uh, so there are worker nodes right and there are distributed uh, key value store like you know etcd so we'll be uh, discussing about each component in the upcoming slides so what is master node what is worker node and why do we need etcd right and if you see the master node right so master node uh, typically it has uh, uh, controller and api server right so api server is uh, uh, the uh, uh, key component to interact with your uh, end user uh, with uh, your uh, worker nodes right and a scheduler okay and you have key value store within master node key value store is like you know kind of your security credentials will store here and when it comes to uh, node so and also uh, these are called worker nodes right so your worker nodes are the uh, instances where the actual applications will be hosted actual containers are hosted <coughs> So see here your uh, <coughs> worker node uh, does contain uh, 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 multiple pods along with uh, queue proxy and queue kubelet, right? <coughs> All right. So So when it comes to Cube API server, right? So it provides uh, uh, the basic, uh, uh, the primary integration between your end user and uh, uh, the application which is hosted on your uh, pod uh, container, <clears throat> right? So all clients, uh, including nodes, uh, users and other applications uh, interact with uh, Kubernetes, right? So they have to always, uh, uh, interact through API server, uh, API uh, server only, right? So there is no other way, only API. <clears throat> and when it comes to ETCD, right? So ETCD acts as the cluster data store. Okay. So this is your cluster database. So it provides a strong uh, uh, and highly available key value store, right? So used for uh, uh, persisting your cluster state, right? So how cluster knows, uh, knows which, which pod is, uh, 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 so <coughs> you, you see here, so within worker node, we have multiple nodes, right? Node one, pod one, pod two, pod one, pod two, pod one, pod two, okay? So let us assume this pod one has, uh, uh, um, Oracle application in it and pod 2 has uh, 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 the um, ESP.NET application, okay. So within this worker node, okay. And these are the uh, uh, duplicate copies of uh, the same pod, okay. So this is, these are the duplicate copies, okay. So let us assume, so there is a failure on node 1 of pod one, like, you know, my Oracle application is hosted here, right? So if so there is a failure on this pod, right? Then uh, the uh, the users, the user is here, right? So the user uh, request has been uh, um, moved to here, right? So while moving, right? So the application has been failed. Then how to redirect that uh, query to here, to the other nodes, right? because so your uh, cluster database, it maintains all the states of your um, um, pods, containers and your nodes, right? So whenever there is a fail, failure at uh, node level or at pod level at, uh, or at any other component level, right? So immediately it redistributes uh, the query to the other available uh, uh, pods or nodes or other components. So this is how it maintains its database. Okay. <clears throat> and when it comes to cube uh, scheduler, right? <clears throat> so, 
so scheduler is like you know kind of uh, um, policy rich engine right so it evaluates your workload requirements and then attempts to place it on a matching resource right so it, uh, it typically uh, um, uh, does you know some kind of load balancing between uh, pods suppose uh, so there are four pods right and there are uh, uh, 10 uh, uh, requests so all those 10 requests will be uh, distributed these uh, to these pods equally right so cube scheduler uh, it does that uh, um, function one of that function <clears throat> like uh, it also provides like uh, you know affinity anti affinity and other uh, uh, custom resource requirements so when i say affinity and anti affinity requirements right so again you know these uh, um these are like you know again for uh, kind of uh, uh, load balancing techniques at uh, various levels like at network level at uh, uh, cpu level and at uh, uh, io level um, uh, input and output read write level right so these affinity anti affinity happens at uh, uh, io level at uh, uh, computing level and at network level right <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> so when it comes to cube uh, uh, controller manager, okay, so this is a primary daemon that manages all core component control loops, right? So this is a primary daemon and it monitors uh, the cluster set uh, through API server, okay? and steers the cluster towards the desired set okay so so this controller manager what uh, it does is like uh, as i explained earlier so it uh, it, uh, it it keeps on monitors uh, the state of each and every uh, uh, worker node or uh, um, pod state right so whenever there is a failure so it immediately uh, 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 brings one more parallel uh, uh, pod node okay it brings uh, actually to the desired uh, state configuration suppose my um, my desired state configuration is uh, my worker node should have at least three pods right Th that is my desired state okay uh, but um, this cube control manager it identified there is one uh, um, pod failure out of three so then what it does is so immediately uh, it deletes that uh, failed pod and then uh, recreates uh, uh, one more pod and then keep it uh, to the desired state, right? So this is the desired uh, state, okay? So these controllers include uh, uh, like, you know, node controller and uh, replication controller and endpoint controllers and also service account and token controllers, right? So the node controller uh, uh, responsible for uh, um, noticing and responding when um, there is a node down okay so replication controller it takes care of uh, uh, the replication uh, uh, between uh, uh, nodes and be between uh, uh, components right and endpoint controllers like you know it populates the endpoint objects right <clears throat> and uh, service account and token controllers so, so they create default accounts and API access tokens uh, for new namespaces, right? So, as I said in previous example, whenever uh, there is a, a failure in a uh, pod, right? So, uh, the um, uh, node controller, what uh, it does is, uh, uh, the cube controller, what it does is, uh, uh, it, uh, it uh, observes that failure and then immediately uh, recreates the failed uh, uh, pod, right? So for that failed uh, pod, so this service account and token controller, it provides uh, the necessary uh, security tokens so that, you know, um, the API um, access can happen. <clears throat> Through API, the communication can happen, right? All right, so.
So what is Cloud Controller Manager? <clears throat> so Cloud Controller Manager, so primarily it uh, uh, deals with your cloud providers. Like uh, if you, uh, you have uh, uh, your uh, um, <clears throat> containers hosted on uh, uh, cloud, right? And uh, you need to uh, um, communicate uh, those containers uh, with your on-premises, right? So this kind of uh, scenario, in these kind of scenarios, your con cloud controller manager uh, uh, comes into picture. So it helps uh, uh, for connectivity between your uh, uh, on-premises and to the cloud providers and between cloud provid providers, Azure to AWS, like that. <clears throat> and also it uh, maintains uh, the individuality uh, between uh, uh, cloud vendors. Suppose, uh, so, um, so there is a container, so which is hosted on uh, Azure, right? And there is a different container, so which is hosted on uh, AWS, right? So they have different, different uh, 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 configurations, right? So um, that level of configuration, so this cloud controller manager, it maintains uh, uh, those configurations as well. <clears throat> So when it comes to worker node, right? So that is uh, Kubernetes node. So if you see here the uh, uh, right side uh, yellow box, so you have a pod, okay? And uh, so you have DNS, a uh, cube DNS, and uh, you have various uh, pods, and uh, you have cube proxy and kubelet and you have Docker. So what pod does, right? <clears throat> so pod uh, is uh, the basic uh, building block of your Kubernetes, okay? So this is where, uh, uh, so you'll be hosting your code, your application, your compute, your storage, everything, right? So this is where your actual uh, container is going to be hosted, your actual container, okay? So pod represents uh, a running process on your cluster, right? And also it encapsulates uh, your application container, right? So, so that is how your, you know, security achieves. And also it can uh, uh, encapsulate your storage resources, your uh, uh, network uh, um, traffic, all those. And also pod represents a unit of deployment, right? So you know, when I say unit of deployment, so single instance of an application in Kubernetes, so which might consist of either a single container or small number of containers, right? So that is the single uh, uh, unit of deployment. All right, so when it comes to kubelet, <clears throat> so kubelet, so this is like, you know, agent. So it runs on each node in the cluster, right? So that means, so without kubelet agent, so there will not be any uh, uh, node running. So all uh, uh, worker nodes should be running with kubelet agent without fail. So if there is no kubelet agent running on a worker node, right? So then that uh, uh, worker node cannot uh, uh, um, function properly. It is a failed worker node. Okay. So what it does is it makes sure that containers are running in a pod. Okay. So primarily it uh, uh, focuses on uh, uh, containers within a pod. Okay. The kubelet. Uh, uh, takes a set of uh, pod uh, specifications, right? So that are provided through various uh, mechanisms and ensures that uh, the containers described in those pod specs are running unhealthy. So that uh, again, you know, so um, it, uh, it, uh, it is referring to the desired uh, state uh, configuration. Okay. <clears throat> So 
So when it comes to cube proxy, cube proxy, uh, uh, it enables uh, the Kubernetes uh, service abstraction uh, by maintaining the network rules on the host and performing uh, connection forwarding. So basically it does uh, uh, the forwarding uh, job, right? So forwarding between your uh, uh, physical uh, network and your uh, network within your uh, pod, okay? So it basically does uh, the proxy, right? So whenever there's a request, right? So <clears throat> uh, for incoming profit, it has to come to your physical network and then it will uh, uh, go to queue proxy and uh, queue proxy will forward that income incoming profit to the appropriate pod, right? Uh, the same way for external for outgoing profit uh, from the respective uh, pods from the respective worker nodes uh, the outgoing traffic will be uh, uh, um, forwarded to queue proxy to the external world so this is how uh, uh, the traffic flow happens all right <clears throat> So container runtime, it is uh, the software. So it maintains uh, 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 the um, set of containers uh, uh, running uh, status, right? <clears throat> Kubernetes supports uh, uh, this uh, uh, type of uh, um, containers like Docker, RKT, and OCI. So these are the typical uh, uh, container uh, containers Kubernetes supports Docker, RKT, OCI, and RunC. Okay. <clears throat> so this is how how uh, the Kubernetes uh, 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 cluster uh, indicates. See again. Uh, so there is a master node. There is a worker node. See multiple worker nodes and uh, there are multiple node processes, right? So Kubernetes, it coordinates uh, uh, a highly available cluster of computers that are connected to the work as a single unit, right? And uh, Kubernetes can also automate the distribution and schedule, scheduling of application containers across uh, clusters. All right. <clears throat> So let us uh, talk about uh, 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 Kubernetes clusters. So you can run the Kubernetes locally on your lab machine or laptop, right? So, so which is Minikube. Minikube is the solution for uh, locally running uh, Kubernetes. So Minikube, it is a tool that makes uh, to run your Kubernetes lo locally and uh, so basically it runs a single node uh, Kubernetes cluster, okay? So, so being said that, so Minikube is not for production. So this is only for testing and uh, your development purposes. So you can just uh, 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 build a Minikube on your uh, test machine and then play around with your uh, uh, containers. Right. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so Kubernetes, uh, this mini cube installation, basically it is uh, uh, a kind of uh, activity. So we just need to uh, 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 first enable uh, the Hyper-V uh, virtualization on our uh, uh, local machine, right? and then uh, 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 um, enable the Hyper-V uh, Hyper and then uh, enable nested virtualization. And from there, you know, uh, using command line, so you just uh, uh, execute uh, uh, Minikube, right? So let me just uh, uh, try to give you a little demo on Kubernetes.
so there is a nice uh, uh, ab article so which uh, provides the step by step uh, procedure to install kubernetes so see here <coughs> so the requirements are so you need to have a windows 2016 or windows 10 and you should be having internet connection and you should uh, enable hyper-v so how you enable hyper-v is uh, if it is windows 10 machine uh, let me show so go here programs and features so here see here run windows feature on or off right so this is the hyper-v okay you need to tick this and then click on OK, it will install Hyper-V and then it will reboot. All right, and then uh, after that, so we need to enable uh, uh, the nested virtualization, right? <clears throat> How you enable nested virtualization is, so this is the command. So this is a command to enable a, a nested virtualization. Okay, set. So let me show you that. So let me open my local Hyper-V. Yes. Okay. So this is my Ubuntu, Ubuntu uh, test machine. So I need to enable nested virtualization for my uh, uh, Ubuntu, okay? So let me open my PowerShell with elevated uh, admin access. All right, so, so this is my complete command. So, so we need to keep the virtual machine name here and uh, expose the virtualization is true. See here, that's it. So my my nested virtualization is enabled. So now it will allow me to <coughs> install Docker Kubernetes on it. All right. So, so after that, <coughs> <coughs> after that, so we need to uh, download kubectl. <clears throat> so this is the command this is the url <clears throat> so kubectl will be downloaded here okay <clears throat> so after that so we need to uh, uh, copy that kubectl to the system32 folder. So you just need to copy this and then uh, 
put it under C system 32. Just paste it. After that, so you need to uh, change your environment variable to system 32, right? And uh, go from here, download Minikube. So this is the URL here. Okay, so you need to select uh, IMD64. Right, so it takes at least uh, 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 one to two hours time. So I am keeping this uh, URL for you in chat. All right, so typically the Minikube installation uh, uh, begins like this. So you need to execute this command. So this is uh, the command. So in PowerShell, so it should be always with the elevated uh, admin rights. Okay. Yes, so the Minikube installation will start. So here, so it is given some error due to network issue. Right, so after that, so it will start downloading uh, your uh, Minikube ISO. And from there, you are done. Okay, so for verification, you can execute kubectl get nodes command. It will give you uh, the Minikube single node, right? <clears throat> So this is the graphical representation of uh, um, monitoring and managing your Kubernetes cluster. So this is called uh, Kubernetes uh, Minikube dashboard. Okay. So once you enable, uh, you know, once you install, set up your Minikube, right? So now uh, if you browse with your Minikube IP, so you'll get this uh, screenshot. Okay. This is dashboard. So from here, you can see all your namespaces, your nodes, your a volumes, what kind of roles, what kind of storage classes, everything will be displayed here and everything can be managed uh, from here. Okay guys, so with this, uh, <clears throat> so I am done with uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, basics uh, uh, concepts and clustering and features. So please go ahead with your questions. <clears throat> So Docker lab document, so yes, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so post this session, so I'll be, I will be adding those details uh, to the uh, um, recorded session, so from there, yeah, you can. All right, so let me uh, go through the previous questions. <clears throat> yeah, there is a question now uh, is Mac OS supports Docker? Yes, yes, Mac OS supports Docker. So next question, what is the rational behind uh, switching, transitioning from Swarm to Kubernetes? Swarm is a Docker uh, uh, product and Kubernetes is a Google product. So that is the difference. Okay. So what is automatic uh, uh, binary packing, right? So suppose, uh, uh, you have a code, so you have a binaries, you have a dependencies, right? So all those uh, uh, can be clubbed and then uh, uh, packed uh, into a single uh, uh, container and the same container can be, you know, orchestrated and then redeployed uh, uh, multiple containers, right? So that is what it means. 
Yes, even Docker uh, Swarm also does the similar kind of functionality like uh, your Kubernetes. Yes, so why Kubernetes is? Kubernetes is uh, the matured uh, uh, tool from Google and it does uh, better than uh, Docker Swarm, okay? So <clears throat> that's it. So what is pod? So pod is uh, 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 the mini uh, uh, deployment unit. So within pod, your containers resides, okay? Yeah, containers are inside pods, right. All right. So Kubelet is uh, present at node, yes. Communication with uh, master and other nodes, yes. So what is the node size? How many pods does the node one holds? Likewise, how many nodes does the master could hold? Yes. So there is no limit. So there is no uh, uh, such limit. So as long as your uh, um, a worker node has that uh, uh, computing capacity like your uh, uh, computing memory storage and networking bandwidth, you can deploy n number of pods. There is no limit. Okay. So how many containers uh, uh, in a pod can hold? Yeah, the pod can have, uh, can hold multiple containers right so as i said so this single pod can have multiple containers with multiple applications right so each container can have each applications like that so multiple applications can uh, have with uh, within single pod all right so how to configure etcd so yeah so you have to uh, access uh, uh, etcd through kubectl Right, so from there you can configure, you can access, you can modify uh, the changes. And uh, yeah, so there is a question enabling Hyper-V is hardware or software? Yeah, enabling a Hyper-V, it is a feature of Windows, right? So if you want your lab set up on Windows, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, virtualization, then Hyper-V. If you want your lab on uh, uh, some other uh, virtualization technology, you have other virtualization technologies like uh, uh, VirtualBox from Oracle. You can use VirtualBox as well. And you have one more like VMware workstation from VMware you can use that as well, okay? So if you want uh, to use your Microsoft uh, uh, for uh, uh, lab, so Hyper-V, you just need to uh, go to your control panel and from there, you, you just need to enable that Hyper-V feature. That's it, very simple. <clears throat> Yes, of course, uh, when it comes to hardware, your um, BIOS, uh, you should enable uh, your uh, virtual virtualization technology on BIOS on your, so these days, all laptops, PCs are uh, uh, built-in uh, VT enabled, built-in VT supported, right? So no need to worry on that. So if it is not enabled, so you just need to go to your BIOS and then uh, uh, enable uh, VT and then uh, reboot your server and then come back and proceed with the lab, that's it. Okay, since Kubelet does uh, uh, manage containers, which is not created through Kubernetes, then how it could support Docker as runtime container? 
So does not manage containers. Kubelet is, uh, you know, kind of uh, your uh, um, managing Kubernetes through command line tool. That is only the difference. Okay. And uh, yeah, Docker lab documents will be, uh, uh, yeah, we can share Docker lab uh, documents, uh, maybe uh, 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 very effective documents uh, in the upcoming uh, webinars or, you know, like this. So what is the advantage of using Kubernetes with Docker? So Kubernetes is uh, the uh, uh, cluster orchestrator uh, to manage your Docker. That's it. <clears throat> yes, so the troubleshooting part, so uh, the troubleshooting part will be, you know, uh, will come into the upcoming uh, webinars. So please uh, uh, stand by. So there will be deep dive sessions, right? So in those deep dive sessions, um, there will be, you know, deep level uh, uh, um, training will happen. All those tools will be, uh, tools will be explained. So parts with nodes and size of those. So there are no limitations when it comes to uh, uh, container size and pod size. So you can uh, keep deploying uh, as long as you have your physical uh, uh, computing capacity available like uh, your CPU, memory, uh, storage and network uh, bandwidth. Yeah, one, up, one container, one application. Yes, this is the best practice. One container, one application. What kind of issues in Docker and how to troubleshoot? Yeah, so these uh, uh, topics will be covered in the upcoming sessions, guys. Yeah, so you can enable uh, uh, your virtualization technology uh, at a bias level of your desktop or laptop. All right, guys, so thanks for your all uh, effective participation and uh, asking uh, uh, very uh, uh, great questions.